as if the stakes in the movie weren't already high enough. Right? <laughs> Amen. She might as well turn to camera. I assure you, this movie thinks it is about something. <laughs> <laughs> it is about Troy Duffy wanting more cocaine. More cocaine. <laughs> yeah, right. If you pop open your DVD player and just dump in a half gram, we'd really appreciate it. <laughs> It'll come back here to home base. God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema because otherwise you wouldn't hang out with us. I'm your host, No Illusions, and sitting 700 miles to my immediate left is my good friend Heath Enright. Heath, welcome back. In nomine patris et fili spiritus santi. Let's do this. Okay. Come on. All right. All right. <laughs> Little too excited. I mean, you already watched the movie and you're that excited. Okay. And sitting 900 <laughs> miles to my northeast is my bad friend Eli Bostic. Eli, how are you this fine afternoon, sir? I'm afraid to do anything in this time for how it will look in the future times, Noah. Can we do a future podcast? I mean, this was this came out in 2009. It was very clear this was all awful then. So, and we're also joined by a returning guest masochist and host of the Queer Splaining podcast, Callie Wright. Callie, welcome back. Let's do some gratuitous violence to the ears. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've already hinted at it pretty heavily, but tell us officially, Callie, what will we be breaking down today? We watched Boondock Saints 2, All Saints Day. It is the story of making very bad tattoo decisions very soon after your 18th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> will you really quick describe the tattoo experience that you're referencing right now? Yes, absolutely. Uh, when I was 16, I was obsessed with the first Boondock Saints movie. And like two or three weeks after I turned 18, I started a big portrait of the brothers on my back <laughs> holding their guns. It's it's the scene from right after where uh, Rocco dies and they're, they're holding their guns like right at the camera. It's their faces with the guns hold, held out and the prayer down the middle. Fantastic. Wow. And was the tattoo artist pretty excited about that? Or did you have to sign a bunch of waivers about the future? <laughs> no, he was he was equally excited. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Fantastic. Holy shit. Well, while it's going to pale in comparison to some of the decisions some of us have made, I've still got to ask. <laughs> it's in the script. Eli, how bad was this movie? Well... If you loved the first movie so much that you, I'm sorry, tattooed it across your back? <laughs> Yikes. I, it's so hopeful that you can start out as a human being who tattoos the protagonist <laughs> of Boondock Saints across your back and end up Callie Wright. There's no, forget those like reformed KKK people that go yeah, on John right, 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 exactly. I, don't, I don't care about those assholes I want to know that you can start out loving Boondock Saints and end up Callie Wright that's that's the message we need for the people <laughs> I used to be a very different person <laughs> see critical race theory works is the point see, that's that's what we're talking about. exactly okay so so obviously our review of the first one was a difficult moment for Heath and, and for Eli. So I have to know. I don't know even know what you're talking did about. You guys, I remember it's, it's us all, recorded, all agreeing that it was bad. We have it on tape. So did you guys like the sequel back in the day? Because like it's every bit as good as the first one. I just I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm curious if this was also a hard revisit type moment. Oh, no, I, I did not see the sequel. But I got to say on a personal note, I've been going through this weird crisis lately. So for unrelated reasons, I've been listening to the archives of our old show. And lately I've been feeling like, oh man, I used to be so funny and like crazy. And I feel less funny. I feel less crazy these days. Like, obviously I said some stuff and did some stuff I didn't love, but like maybe I've lost my edge. And then I watched this movie and I was like, you know, it's good to change with the time. You don't want to stay the same. Really. It's probably better to just transform as, as time moves you. Doesn't already, really probably. matter what's tattooed on your back now. <laughs> yeah. <it's>, you know, <laughs> yeah. Your father's today. actually intended. You know what? You know, it's good. It's good. It's I switched sorry, it up. It's, all right. it's cool. It's all right. I liked it in 2009, but then I also learned about what the sunk cost fallacy is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. No, that's so. fair. Fair. All right. So is there anything you guys want to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? Yeah. I'm going to go with best worst heroic superpower ish thing that they have is there a so okay uh, billy Connolly is in this movie mm -hmm. 
And I bet he's super proud of that. Yeah, that, he's such a good actor. But he's in this. I don't know how they got him back. But they give us his kind of superhero-ish backstory. It doesn't make sense, but it's all based on the idea that he became super powerful long ago because he invented a vest. Mm -hmm. like a vest <laughs> that holds guns that changed him into a vigilante superhero. And not even in a logical way from nope. which you could quickly draw them or any. Yeah. Uh huh. Mm -mm. It's like it's vibranium, but a leather vest like John Popper from Blues <laughs> Traveler. It makes no sense. <laughs> the vest is one of the many things about this movie that I would have like bet good money would always be cool when the first movie came out. <laughs> and watching it now, it was just like, they look like nipples. Got gun nipples. Why? <laughs> it's like a gun nipple possum. Like a what vigilante happened? Vigilante blackjack dealer. I don't know what's happening. I actually sat on my couch trying to like move my arms to like get at where the guns were. Right. Right. And I just it's like, just so <laughs> illogical and stupid. Yes. Like I hit the pause button and I took a second. Like is this no, this is not it does Ow, not work. I got a cramp. This you would cramp. You would cramp up. That doesn't even make sense. I'm going to go with best worst inspiration for people you thought were your friends to make fun of you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> pretty solid as far as those Fair. go. The sure. whole point is I just wanted you to tell the story. <laughs> That's, why you're invited. That's why we're doing the movie. You're also very talented, but like really I just feel that. very wanted. Thank you. Yeah, fuck having you on. That's why we're doing this review at all. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I was going to go with best worst seasonal subtitle. For fuck's sake, the name of this movie is Boondock Saints 2, All Saints Day. All Saints Day is the day after fucking Halloween. You fucking idiots. You have your title gave you all the excuse you needed to load this movie up with Halloween imagery. And your dumb ass has never realized that? No. No. Mm -mm. no. no. The idea that you think Troy Duffy would have Googled <laughs> anything, including the title of his own film. <laughs> I am surprised that you seem surprised by that. <sighs> he definitely Googled list of ethnic slurs and turned it into a script. So he <laughs> Googled some stuff. I he feel like Troy just knew all of them. Let's yeah. not undersell <laughs> Troy. Taking That's dictation from homophobic slur God. Yeah, he saved some time on research on that one. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of that, I was going to go with best worst back tattoo, but then Kelly ruined it with their with theirs. So, oh, get ready for it. The rest of the episode, I'm going to steal every one of those jokes from you, you fucking asshole. <laughs> Fair. Fair. <laughs> I'm going to go with best worst homophobia. Y'all, were we this homophobic? Because here's the thing. I don't remember taking in this media and being like, hmm, this homophobia is problematic, which makes me think that there was a time in my life where I watched this movie and I was like, yes, another metaphor about being fucked in the ass. Good. They're really <laughs> expressing their emotions and the situation well to each other. <laughs> I mean, there was absolutely a time where we were this homophobic. I don't think it was 2009, though, when this movie came out. That's the other thing, though. 2009 is so recent, y'all. It's, yeah, it's really not that long ago. Original Boondog Saints, it was all fun and games for me and Heath to be like, oh, my goodness, can't believe we liked this movie. 2009, y'all were listening to me talk occasionally. <laughs> well, not, not quite that, but yeah. All right. So, well... There's a lot of so that I told you on the other side of this break. So we're going to give everybody a minute to prepare for that. But we'll be back in a flash with all the random bullshit that is Boondock Saints 2, All Saints Day. Lou, 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 doing Cali stuff. Cali stuff is my favorite stuff. Hey, hey, Cali. Oh, hey, Noah, what's up? Uh, well, Eli and Heath wanted to know if you're good to record at two. Uh, yeah, yeah, two is fine. Did you... Seriously come all the way over to my house just to ask that? Yep. Yep. He's and Eli have terrible cell reception at the house. Plus, the, the plan got so expensive, we all just kind of share one number. So it, it's just gotten to where it's easier for me to drive over here and ask. Hmm. Well, that seems inconvenient. Oh, it is. I, I've just been trying to get him to switch over to Mint Mobile, but they won't listen. What's uh, Mint Mobile? Damn it, Callie. Come on. Spreadsheet is already really? huge. Wait, are they in the car? Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Why didn't you guys just come in and ask me? We're not allowed to legally set foot in Kentucky. K 
because of what they did to the Covington Catholic kids? Because of what they did to the Covington Catholic kids, yeah. So mm. Mint Mobile offers premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. Wow. 15 bucks a month. What's the catch? To be fair, we didn't expect the fire to spread like it did. The there fire- isn't a catch. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they're the first company to sell wireless service online only. By cutting out retail stores, there's no crazy overhead costs that get passed down to you in the form of mystery fees. Instead, Mint just passes on sweet savings direct to you. Yeah, when they became a sponsor, I actually switched and saved hundreds a month. And I haven't noticed any difference in my service, which is great. Also, the fact that that girl fell and blocked the door... I, that had largely nothing to do with us. Oh, all, us. All, all plans come with unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own cell phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. And if you're not 100% satisfied, Mint Mobile has you covered with your seven-day money-back guarantee. Wow, that does sound good. Oh, it was not good. Yeah, that blocked exit was most of the problem, Callie. No, Definitely they, not good. they meant the cell phone, guys. Right. Oh, meant- cell phone. Yeah, oh, oh, God. that is good. Yes. Yeah. So to get your new wireless plan for 15 bucks a month and get that plan shipped directly to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash gam. That's mintmobile.com slash gam. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash gam. T Dog, what up? Troy Duffy. Troy Duffy. Hey, Phil. Uh, who, who are these folks? Oh, these are my teenage sons, Carl and Ryan. <laughs> fuck yeah, dude. Dude, fuck yeah. Right? Yeah. They're huge fans of the original movie. Very excited that we're finally going to be making oh. Boondock Saints 2 <laughs> oh, as yes. a sequel. Yes. So uh, I hope you don't mind if I do it in the boys in the room, but can we see the script? Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, script. Uh, here, um, uh, here you go. Uh, Troy? Mm-hmm, yeah. This is the script for Boondock Saints 1. What? <laughs> no. No, it's... Yep, no, not. it is. You, you, you tore out the first ten pages, and, and you crossed out Willem Dafoe's name and wrote Super Hot Lady. Uh, you also crossed out Rocco on most, but not all of the pages, and wrote some Mexican guy, but that is those are literally all the changes you made. Right. That's dip, different. Th- well, I was also going to write a uh, backstory for the dad for... Uh, oh, Billy okay. okay. Uh, how long a backstory were you thinking? I mean, is that most of the... Uh, ten minutes-ish. Oh, okay, Troy. Well, we this movie it. is going to rip love it. ass. Fantastic. Rip so much ass. Yeah, let's make the movie. <laughs> Awesome. I'm terrified of gay people. I know you are, Carl. Scary. (laughs) And we're back for the breakdown, and we're going to start off with uh, Noah snickering at the warning that this movie was, and I quote, intended for mature audiences. (laughs) (laughs) Fuck you. And Rocco's given us this opening speech here, but I like that it's sort of a downgrade from the whatever that lady who didn't actually get killed by people in front of everyone's speech was from the first movie, right? The first (laughs) movie speech was like, who will stand when people are murdered in the street? And Rocco's speech is like, I'll tell you how many sweaters I sold at this TJ Maxx I've been working at for the last 11 years. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, it was a dead guy from the first one walking into a church at the beginning of the movie. I'm like, okay, totally counts for Gam. God damn it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, I was wondering about that at first, but yeah, I right then I got it there too. Yep. So, okay, so we get some credit stuff. We cut to Ireland. <laughs> and it's Braveheart. <laughs> yeah, sure. Is. Best worst fake beards, by the way. I'd like to add best oh. worst fake beards right now. Oh, it's like Karl Marx Muppets all of a sudden out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a high school production of Fiddler on the Roof. It is not yeah, good. No, it looked like a fucking Bible play or something. Yeah, they had these silly, ridiculous. And I, I noticed this on the IMDb page. The opening shot, we see the two main characters from the first one killing a wolf that's trying to attack their sheep, but like wolves don't live in Ireland so <laughs> they might as well be trying to uh, like kill a tiger that was trying to attack their sheep so. I also like that they have matching Aaron sweaters like every tourist <laughs> <laughs> I don't know it's just a lot cozier than the rest of the movie's gonna be they're just close they're allowed to they're, they're brothers <laughs> yeah. they're close it's fine <laughs> so okay and then 
Billy Mo- Connolly cuts in to do an opening monologue, and we're like, fuck you, we've already had the opening monologue. <laughs> is this like one of those neither have been nor the rock is allowed to lose this fight contract things? Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> he had he had a, a four monologues in his contract. Yeah, exactly. I, I think Billy Connolly was like, I'll, I'll do like a minute of on screen and three minutes of voiceover. That's what you get. Yeah. And yeah. I'll give did. you double of the time that Willem Dafoe is giving you. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love to. So, OK, so Billy Connolly's opening monologue is basically everything was fine. And then for no discernible reason, I knew that the sequel had started. <laughs> <laughs> I felt somewhere that Troy Duffy had run out of cocaine and I had no choice <laughs> but to return. I ran out of head of the class money. Also, <laughs> something was calling my boys back. It was probably <laughs> running water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then a priest shows up and he goes, something's happened. And I'm like, there you go, writers. Something has happened. You <laughs> nailed incident it, has been incited. <laughs> <laughs> what I love is that the priest who runs in drives up parks and then runs in out of breath and I'm like dude I don't think you're out of breath the entire drive across the Irish (laughs) Moors you don't know his health situation that's true (laughs) that's true true. true. don't be judged parking was far away so (laughs) so meanwhile (laughs) in Boston there's a buzz cut guy moving slowly and ominously it seems to be a Tuvan throat singer killing a priest while (laughs) Tuvan throat singing which is (laughs) confusing (laughs) So, yes, and and he pulls out the pennies for the eyes and everything, which, by the way, means that he's framing these two characters for this murder. I don't remember the first one well enough to know that. Yeah. Jesus fucking Christ, the movie. Mm -hmm. Well, you're obviously just not a real fan. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, (laughs) oh, it's the pennies because it's it's their signature thing. They put that on the eyes. Nice. Call back. I love these movies. Yeah. Really (laughs) flip me real fast on that. (laughs) This is all going to work out. I'm a sucker for a reference. What can I say? <laughs> so, and then we cut back to the priest telling them about this. This is the inciting incident, right? Like, oh, this this guy shot some priest and tried to make it look like you did it. And the priest is like, now, I want you to not do anything at all about this. He's like, why are you telling them then? <laughs> yeah. I came here to tell you not to do anything. Bad plan. Shit. Stupid plan. <laughs> you didn't even know about it. I wouldn't be out of breath. There wouldn't be a sequel. Everybody would be happier. <laughs> also... I don't know why they made this choice, but the only visible tattoo they have on Billy Connolly in this scene is his weird butterfly tattoo. Like he's a 19 year old girl at Coachella. (laughs) And I would just like to deflect attention away from my bad tattoo decision right right now (laughs) because he looks down at it and he's got that look on his face like he knows. Well, and then the other pre- the, the, the two main characters wander off to go like action up or whatever. And he's like, oh, they're going on. Billy's like, yeah, man, you. You kill a priest in a church, and Heath and Eli suddenly decide it counts for gam, apparently, so so we have no choice in this matter. Just going. And it wasn't the kid fucking. It was... (laughs) Right. Right. That's not what brought him back. And then we get fucking power cords, motherfucker. (laughs) Sure do. I always knew John Wick was based on this movie. Uh, I mean, it wouldn't be a Boondock Saints movie without the shitty generic dad rock. Right. Yeah, yep. right. Like Absolutely. that's a requirement. Well, and you can't really dig up your box of murder without some some dad rock, right? You gotta I mean, have some in the air. And look, I know this is a movie trope, not a Christian movie trope, but just once when someone digs up their 14-year-old guns, I want them to be as rusted and shitty as they would be. <laughs> It's like, oh, right. You didn't seal Metal that all the way. Underwater. Uh, yeah. Oh. Okay, but God is on their side. Yeah, that's, well, that's, <laughs> that's it. true. That's yeah, fair, God, yeah, God kept yeah. them fresh. God controls oxidation. Yeah, no, if not, the guns would have keep sinking down into the ground further and further. So, some Mormon <laughs> reference. <laughs> they also shower like extra hard here it seems like because we're still getting like the power rock as they're like scrubbing themselves as if they hadn't showered the entire time they were in ireland right that's canon <laughs> or not not ireland given the, the, <laughs> right. yeah, whatever the wars of yeah. ireland <laughs> and okay my favorite part of the shower moment is we get to see their back tattoos that they have yep and apparently these brothers have a tandem tattoo of Jesus Christ getting crucified, like a two-part, like thing. The, like a piggyback, like, like they would have to, yeah, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, they have to be in chicken fight position, but then you can see our <laughs> Lord and Savior as he died. It only for pays the off Simpsons. once in a while, but it sure the fuck pays off. Yeah. All I'm saying is there are worse tattoo decisions than mine. <laughs> <laughs> and all I'm saying is Patreon goal. Heath and I will get those exact tattoos. There is enough money, people. I'm just That's saying. Right. Uh, Eli will get one to match me. Yep. <laughs> oh, speaking of Patreon goals, so there's a there's a moment here where like they come back in after they're all geared up. And they're like, what are you going to do? And one of the brothers throws two pennies on the table. But he's so badass, they both flip heads up. Damn. <laughs> like he's Apparently, he's so badass, he can only flip pennies heads up. I'm like, that sounds so over the top. It's like I'm complimenting a patron on scathing. That's so fucking stupid. It's like one in four badass. I do have right. to say, though, I, I appreciate the demonstration of how not gay this movie is with all of the ass shots. Yeah, in the uh, show. it's yeah. gratuitous <laughs> ass shots yeah. that have nothing to do with anything. Yeah, but they've, they've dug up their guns and they've trimmed their silly ass beards and we've seen their asses. So now it's time for the title, Boondock Saints 2, All Saints Day. And no, it doesn't take place in late October or anything. Just That's just a <laughs> phrase with saints in it. So we title screen our way to Boston. The news is I guess, catching me up on what the first movie was about. <laughs> <laughs> Just a reminder, the uh, first movie was about these guys who decide to shoot bad guys and then they disappeared and got away with it. Yeah, there, they were definitely planning like we have to appeal to people who haven't seen the first movie. There's going to be a whole new legion of fans. Yep. <laughs> so we have to make sure. <laughs> Roger Ebert promised he'd come watch this one. <laughs> And this is where we get Greenlee and Duffy. You remember the Boston cops who nope, helped no, out from the no, first one? Sure Come on. Know. Greenlee and Duffy. Wow. Read a book. We have Greenlee <laughs> and Duffy and they're back, but they're freaking out. They're like, we're fucked. And specifically they say, we're elephant dick fucked. Yes. What? Also, I'm very not gay. If I was so... gay, I would be obsessed with dicks, but I am not obsessed with dicks. As you could tell, I'm very much uh, afraid about getting fucked with a dick. So, yeah, that's how not gay I am, is I just constantly talk about the idea of myself getting fucked by a dick. 85% of this movie is someone referencing being fucked in the ass. Yeah. In this case, by an elephant. Yeah, boy, by all kinds of different stuff. Yeah. And then another cop walks in. And he's like, hey, guys, you um, you talking about getting fucked by an elephant? We have <laughs> cop stuff to do. And now we're going to meet Willem Dafoe part two. And one thing I got to say about this scene is my thought was, OK, it's not copaganda, at least. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. yeah, that's fair. <laughs> this is Lady Willem Dafoe. And <laughs> what's amazing about this movie and I'm going to talk about this so much during this review, is that not only do you get to watch what Troy Duffy thinks is a movie, you get to watch Troy Duffy guessing what he thinks people liked about the first movie. <laughs> right, because he's probably in the same boat as I was with, of like, really? Okay, I just don't, I don't even know. All right. Yeah. So he's trying to do Willem Dafoe here, right? He called Willem Dafoe, right? He looked him up in the phone book. Willem Dafoe was like, go fuck yourself. I'm in real movies now. <laughs> and so he was like, all right, fine. I'll, what, what, am I, what are my viewers like that isn't Willem Dafoe? Boobs. Great. So I'll get a hot lady and she'll sound like foghorn leg. <laughs> 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 Uh, I was going to say, this movie is also Troy Duffy guessing at what a badass woman sounds like and talks like. <laughs> yeah. Because he very clearly has no idea. Right. So, yeah. So this woman gets out of the car wearing 22 inch heels. Right. This ridiculous long shot. And then we hear her accent. Her southern accent is there to make these guys Irish accents sound good. Right? <laughs> Daniel Craig is just watching from a director's chair offset. No, that's that's going to be obscure. Not a lot of people are going to get that Daniel, one. <laughs> Daniel Craig nailed that accent. Okay. But yeah, but she explains that she's in charge here and she even uses some slurs against mentally disabled people to really emphasize the point. Yeah. It's, the good old days. Fuck. Yeah. It's, it's a throwback. All right. <laughs> Troy Duffy spent 10 years writing this. Yes, he did. 10 years. years putting the, he 
poured over this over and and this is what he came up with. I, that's Ooh. that's in my notes more than anything else. Me just being Ooh. like, that's ten years of Troy Duffy's life. He's been Barack 10 years. Obama was president when this movie was being made. <laughs> Guys, I was excited for this movie yep. when it came out. <laughs> Someone <laughs> must have been. Somebody I, had to be that. Yeah, actually, George W. Bush was president while this was being yeah, made. Yeah, while this was being made. <laughs> so, okay. So then we cut to a dock where there's some, some boxing going on. Now, the movie's not going to explain this to you. I'll go ahead and let you know that the main characters are stowing uh, uh, away on some cargo ship that's going to take them to the U.S. And this is like... I, I don't know, the big underground boxing tournament pre everybody stowing away on the ship, you know, to just decide who's yeah. the baddest ass. They're they're at Guile's board from Street Fighter 2. Yes. For <laughs> sure. <laughs> Which is also an underground fight club thing where you can pick out, you know, uh, new third guys for sequels if you need right, them. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. It's as though Troy was informed that the first movie covered all the problematic aspects of Americana except for racism and like David Duke and whoever else sponsored this film were like <laughs> okay we're gonna need a lot more racism in the next one we're gonna need you to really up the racism in Boondock Saints too. Oh yeah so this is where we meet Romeo who is our Mexican mullet character and Troy Duffy just has a blast making an actual Mexican actor say his observations on Mexican culture because it can't oh. be bigoted then. Yep. Carlos Mencia is sitting next to Daniel Craig in a different director's <laughs> chair, just being like, it's a little bit much. I'm not going to lie. It's a little bit much. <laughs> this character literally ranks the races for fighting because Troy Duffy made him say that. Yep. Paid <laughs> this man. I mean, to Mexican say it. is first, apparently. So he was like, oh, it's woke. I'll it's have a Mexican guy say they're the best at fighting. Yeah. 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 And you know, Mexicans are tough. Why? Because they invented Tabasco. No. Nope. <laughs> no. Nope. That was started by Ed McElhaney from Maryland, I believe. So, all right. <laughs> Families from Louisiana. Eventually, it's fine. And by the way, like, so we establish in this moment that this character, Romeo, is very clever and can kick a lot of ass. He will never do anything clever and he will never kick any ass in the entire fucking movie. There's no reason. No, there must be a deleted scene where all the badassery gets sucked out of him by a ghost that was eventually cut for time from the main plot of the movie. Yeah. I'm sorry, did you miss his catchphrase from later in the movie? Come on. Yeah, guys. that's fair. He had several good ones. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> those were awesome. Let's be, let's be fair, at least. Yeah. yeah. No spoilers, but he does have some help with those. Yeah. <laughs> Takes some time. All right, so now Eunice is the, is the hot foghorn leghorn cop. She's walking her way through the crime scene, you know, channeling Willem Dafoe a little bit. Yeah, she, she's doing that Willem Dafoe, Will Graham thing that the smartest cop can apparently do in every movie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, it's always based on the angle someone was holding the guns at. I, if I ever murder someone, I'm going to hold guns backwards over my right. shoulders. I'll never get caught. Apparently, you can thwart all of forensics by just turning your wrist to a weird angle like they're gonna think i'm nine foot eleven <laughs> <laughs> i was thinking like troy duffy's thinking like okay she's got to do the willem dafoe thing but it's the sequel so we have to take it up a notch and tits in a bad southern accent yep, yep is, <laughs> is where he went <laughs> that is a step up from willem dafoe i'm just gonna say well yeah, at least exactly. willem dafoe yeah. and boondock yeah. saints anyway yeah, but so she sexily recreates the crime scene for all of them, explaining that the guy who committed the crime must have been short and therefore couldn't have been the main characters. Was shortism a thing? I, this is the first movie I've seen that contained shortism. There was like a <laughs> lot of humor being bound out of someone being four inches shorter than the national. Yeah, average. no, it's like, have <laughs> right. you ever met you and Morgan? It's like that. <laughs> <laughs> and they're called little people for the record. <laughs> okay, and then we cut over to a bad guy dinner where all the bad guys are sitting around a, a dinner table like all the bad guys are want to do. Mm -hmm. And we're going to learn that the main bad guy for now in the movie is the son of the main guy in the last movie. And it's Judd Nelson. Yes, it is. <laughs> Very excited about that. Yeah, I'm sure he's super proud of this one. I also love that we're like 10 minutes into the movie and we are getting yet another flashback of the courtroom scene. <laughs> like, hey guys, right. did you hear? Did you hear? They killed a bunch of people in a courtroom. Did you hear? Yeah. yeah remember? You guys remember in that first movie when this happened? You guys like that? Just 
Troy Duffy sitting there desperately waiting for his chance to glue in two pages from the old yeah. script again. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So I have to point out this bit of blocking. I love it so much. So Judd Nelson is doing the bit where he's walking around behind everybody on the table as he monologues, but he's going way too fucking fast. Right. So he's like already made three full revolutions and he's still got a lot of speech left to go. And it's just silly at this point. <laughs> You want to spin back the other way? I feel like you're getting dizzy. You <laughs> My neck is starting to hurt this You're doing way, a big look, mafia speech. It's going to take away from it if you fall. <laughs> but it's also funny because he can't words right. No. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what does he try to say? Serendipitous? And yeah. There it is. He can't yeah. say it. And then somebody's like, serendipitous, you're trying to say it. And he's like, fuck you, nerd. And then he gets hit in the, the, the nerd gets hit in the face with the biggest oversized comic relief salami I've ever seen out of nowhere. <laughs> Why would they yeah. have that at the table? Where was that at right? the table? I was watching. You would need <laughs> such a large area for it. It wouldn't fit under the table. It was huge. He was carrying the salami the whole time. It's also such a weird, like, racism moment, right? Where it's like, and then the Italian hits the other Italian with a big fucking salami. <laughs> it's, I can't. It's like the spit that flew out of Harvey Weinstein's mouth. Wrote this script. Oh, God. It's like my high school wrote this script. <laughs> and I love the all the people are sitting at the table. They all look really uncomfortable. And I can't tell if it's because like they know they're doing a bad job at acting or <laughs> like, I, don't, um, I don't know. It's hard to say. G given the script, they kind of had to say the words in the script. Can I just point out one particular quote? I think I know which quote it's going to yeah. be. Yeah. Uh -huh. So Judd Nelson says, they prison fucked us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then he pauses. Okay. And he's like, in the ass. Yeah, no, we saw where you were like, going yeah. there. Yeah. Okay. And then they wiped their dicks on our grandma's graves. <laughs> what? <So. laughs> that metaphor has a lot going on. Yeah, there is there is a lot there. <laughs> okay, so according to the subtitles, it was on our grandma's drapes. Oh, Wait. interesting. Okay, now that makes more sense. It makes more <laughs> sense, but yeah, like if you were just raped anally, I feel like where they did the cleaning up is inconsequential, right? Like to but you, going to your this... like li your living grandma's house and fucking up the nice drapes. That's mean. <laughs> the grave, like who cares? Whatever, it's rock. Also, it's gonna rain. I just need to throw out there: we're eight minutes into this movie. There have been two separate. Different sets of fucked in the ass jokes. Yep. I've watched gay pornography that has less mention <laughs> of anal sex at this point. So. <laughs> All right. So now we cut back to our heroes touching up each other's tattoos. <laughs> they're, okay. They're scribbling like extra stuff over the tattoos to make them different as if to like be covert when they get to America. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah, okay. But they were literally on camera in a courtroom openly killing people. So like what? I thought, I, I thought they were I thought they were just doing touch-ups because they're artists and that's what artists do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, no okay. work of art is ever finished, Heath. It is only abandoned, you say. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, but but they even have to point out because they're like, yeah, you know, everybody's seen us on camera, like we should have probably kept those beers and they're like, right, right, but we it, it's a badass ass washing scene and everything going on. It just, you know, I was kind of in the yeah. moment. I wanted one of them to be like, also, we probably should have kept the beers so everyone wouldn't see just how terribly we've aged. <laughs> <laughs> wow, those moors of Ireland were hard on you, huh? <laughs> Did you get cut from an early season of The Walking Dead? Is that what happened on the <laughs> Irish moors? <laughs> That's fine. He got to be in a bad video game. They were they were mauled by Irish wolves. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and of course, then we we it's been almost eighteen seconds since the last gay joke. So one of them suggests to the other one that he dyes his hair, and he's like, "What? Like some kind of gay mo?" And then they fight about whether he's a gay mo. Yes, and we know again that they don't like gay stuff because they are shirtless on top of each other, <laughs> drawing on each other. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> One from behind the other. Yeah, uh huh. Yeah, straightest yeah. activity two men can engage in. Yeah, mm -hmm. but but the implication is that anybody who has blonde hair is somehow gay. Is what they're saying. Yes. That's, uh huh. And then one of them says, "Stay gold, pony boy," <laughs> which. <laughs> Troy Duffy clearly says in real life and thinks it has a sexuality component. Like that's <laughs> yeah. in his head. I was like, yeah, nailed it. That's just, 
<laughs> Wait, there's a different Sorry. context for Pony Boy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you, you guys remember that great queer positive movie, The Outsiders. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yep. yeah, and then, okay, and then, but this is also where Romeo realizes who they are. He's like, wait, you guys are the main characters from the first one. Am I the sidekick? <laughs> and then so they pretend they're going to kill him for a good chuckle. Because it's not a party until you've convinced someone you're going to kill them. C- clearly, yeah. Hey, y'all, is this why... Our generation of men don't have friends is because this is how we learned people bonded. Yes, <laughs> like actually, yeah. throughout this movie, they'll just constantly be violent against each other and terrible to each other. And I'm like, oh, this is why we don't have any friends. <laughs> this, <laughs> That's true. This is our I, model for friendship. At some point, I stopped putting guns to my friend's head, and my social life went downhill very quickly. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> right. So okay. So meanwhile. Eunice is at the police station summarizing her findings of the murder scene to the boss cop. She's pretty sure the murder was Yakaveta's fault. That's uh, Judd Nelson's character. Hey, I just think I had a hallucination in the middle of this scene. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In the middle of this scene, apropos of nothing, did someone walk over to general head of police with a small dog, offer it to him, get like a not right now head shake and walk back out of the yes, scene. Yes. That absolutely happened. Okay. <laughs> what the fuck was that? I need that to be the rest of the movie. Just <laughs> explaining why that would happen. What's, what's the significance? I want to know what that dog did. Yeah. I want to know the dog's name. I want to know what it enjoys. I just. <laughs> absolutely. Also, uh, one other small point in the scene. Oh, uh, Eunice Bloom, the FBI agent, uh, the replacement for Willem Dafoe. She has a holster here Mm -hmm, she's mm -hmm. holding a gun it's a crotch holster Mm -hmm. it's literally is that is that a thing do people have those i also was wondering that (laughs) i think it's fantastic because she's wielding it she's just like all right you're gonna make me wear this i'm gonna make it really really i'm gonna swing it around i'm gonna make a big (laughs) deal about this (laughs) Well, and I love the the dumbassery of the writing in this scene. The chief of police is like, all right, tell me one right now why I shouldn't go public with this. And it's like, it's because it's an unfounded accusation at this point, dumbass. And she's like, do a walk and talk with me in case anybody thinks that we really don't know the cinematography for that. And he's like, oh, okay. Well, that would conveniently split us up from the Three Stooges cops from the first movie and they could have their own scene. That works out great. Yeah, and you know what? The uh, stopwatch just went off. Let's have them do another uh, slur yeah, mm-hmm. here. Yeah, oh, yes, more slurs. Course, yeah. yeah, and okay, so this time, they're to the, the cops, Greenlee and Duffy, they're talking about how they're going to get thrown in jail because they helped the serial killers. And they say something about eating a cock sandwich if they go to jail. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Why would it be a sand? What's the sandwich element there? What's in this? It's not because. Yeah. Are the cocks the bread? Or is or is there bread? Are we putting cocks in bread? They're really <laughs> the metaphors. You you really got it's, you got to think about it. It's a thinky movie. <laughs> <laughs> I I prefer cock tacos, personally. <laughs> is that a sandwich? All right, well, now we've got a whole big some fucking be- argument going on. Some, pe- some so people say bit. those are the same thing. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know if, uh, so far, we don't have time for that kind of shit. Sandwich nest. So <laughs> there was also this great moment where the guy's like, well, what if the main characters never show up at all? What if this isn't even the sequel? And the other guy's like, this is definitely the fucking sequel, man. And I'm like, okay, good. Something's going to happen then. Eventually, <laughs> they promise. Spoiler alert: they're gonna no. get there. It's yeah. a slow burn. <laughs> yeah. It's good writing. It definitely burns. Yeah. All right. Well, on that assurance that there's definitely gonna be a movie any minute now, I suppose we can take a quick break. But we'll be back in a minute with even more Boondock Saints Two All Saints Day. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Hi, I'm Callie Wright, emotionally vulnerable podcaster, and I'm Heath Enright, also. Here, I'm also here. If you've got something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals, therapy is a fantastic way to help with that. And so is drinking. No, drinking is not. Well, maybe you're not drinking enough, Callie. Sounds like you're not drinking enough. That's why there's better help. What's better help? What? Come on. You're not even in this one. Yes, I am. I go to therapy all the time. It helps me with my postpartum depression. Mm. Wait, Wait, dads get that? They sure do. And again, therapy really helped me. So anyways, what's better help, Callie? Okay, it still counts as one. That's just it one. It does. Yeah, it counts as one. It's the rule. 
BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It is professional therapy done securely online. So I don't need people to come wrap me in a straitjacket. It's not that. Nope. Plus, there's a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas. So if you need someone trans affirming, secular or sex and sex work positive, they can help you with that. Okay, but what if I don't like my therapist? I have to wait till they die, right? Then I meet a a new person at their funeral, something like that. Nope. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change therapists if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline therapy, and financial aid is available. Visit BetterHelp.com slash awful, that's better H-E-L-P, and join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Plus, God Awful Movies listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash awful. BetterHelp, it's therapy, but better. I really think you're not drinking enough. Heath, Heath. I'm just saying, it's happiness in a cup. From the makers of the Boondock Saints. You ready, Boishi? You know it, Hiam. Comes an action movie that's just stereotypes and gun noises because apparently people really, really love that. Oh no, those Jewish bastards are on to us. Jewish Jews! This summer, the June Doc Saints. We already made $10 million. Gashploinka! And we're back for more of this shit. And we're going to open up on our heroes arriving in the States, sidekick in tow. This is so that we can make fun of how silly them Mexicans in their cars are. Why is Jesus upside down? (laughs) There are so many. Jesus was upside down. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Yeah, Little little bobblehead Jesus Jesus thing. Yeah. It was stuck to the roof of the car in front of the passenger seat. (laughs) (laughs) There are so many moments in this movie where I'm like, okay, they're teasing this. And it's going to be important later. Nope. It's always just for the racist or homophobic joke. <laughs> always. Yeah. yeah. Nothing will ever, ever matter. Yeah. This is just going to be the whole movie, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. It, yeah. Mm-hmm. So they apparently they, they get to America and they immediately drive to Yakovetta's bad guy warehouse so they can send him a message. OK, but it's not even Yakov. It's Yakovetta is working with a different gang, a Chinese gang, and this is their spot. Oh, I'm sorry, and, Heath. Yeah. Did I not get and, all the nuances? Okay, <laughs> please. Yeah. Oh. Well, it's an important point, but the Boondock Saints guys are like, okay, that doesn't, doesn't help us find our guy. I guess we could have like a gunfight with this gang as a warm up. And yeah, that's what they're going to do. <laughs> that is the plan. <laughs> yeah, they got to get back into the action. It's, yeah. Sure. Yeah. And it was like, all right, here's the plan he coats and cigarettes. Oh, I was done. I was done. Okay. Yeah, I was, <laughs> yep. What if we they did it black exploitation style? What does that even mean? <laughs> they do the, the the fade to white transition so we know it's about to get real serious. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but first we have to have that moment where Romeo needs a gun, right? Oh, God, and they're like, yes. here, you can have a gun, but you have to have this little tiny gay one. Yep. This little unmasculine gun. (laughs) Y'all, I was going through it while I was not paying attention to this stupid movie because it's boring and terrible. I can think of five films from a 20-year period that did exactly this joke. Yep. Why why did five films all feel the need to be like, you get it? Because your gun's like a penis. (laughs) (laughs) Well, also, like, until you handed it to Romeo... You were carrying that gun, right? So, like, 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 do you just carry around a tiny gun to emasculate potential sidekicks? I don't understand this. Well, they had to do the callback, right? Because there was there was a, a joke like that in the first movie. This is a fucking pea shooter. Oh, yeah. So okay. they, they had to do the they had to do the callback. It's yeah, deep. Absolutely. Get, this Get is, with it. It's deep. It's actually a double Easter egg. It's what Callie just said. Plus, it's a callback to Agent Paul Smecker, Small Pecker small gun metaphor i wasn't given this movie as stew yeah you're right yeah no. think about the writing i mean just it's like, like yeah. godfather yeah. too yeah no i'm really it's, it's all coming together the, the, the metaphors are nested and then okay i thought tenant was good but this so, is really pulling a lot of shit <laughs> troy duffy's a visionary <laughs> <laughs> so now i'm seeing why it took 10 years yeah so okay so then we do that annoying fucking thing from the first one where we skip over the action sequence to the crime scene and then fill in 
the action sequence with like backfill shit with flashbacks. Okay, but the thing is, when they did this in the first movie, Willem Dafoe did it bad. Right? He was like, there is a firefight. Right? Like the thing <laughs> yeah. that made that, and I use heavy air quotes on this, <laughs> epic, is Willem Dafoe's construction of the action scene. However, they've decided to go with like the Laurel and Hardy school of action scenes <laughs> yes. for this entire sequel. So she's reconstructing it and she's like, and that's where he slipped and fell on a banana peel and that one <laughs> pooped his pants. <laughs> It's like listening to Formula One announcers describe a Mario Kart race. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, they, they, they like in the entire movie, you would never if if you didn't already know it from the first one and get heavy hints from the like musical stings, you would never know these characters were supposed to be badass, right? Because they right. just like always fuck everything up and then coincidentally kill everyone. So that's going to start here where we have the scene where like the plan is, is that the guy is going to drive them in a forklift to the bad guys and then they're just going to pop out of a box and shoot them. That's the plan. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't go that well. I will point out that pop out, pop up, suddenly arrive at a surface and then shoot at bad guys who will never aim at us, even though we're holding perfectly still will be their plan for all the gunfights in the movie. Well, like, we knew what an action sequence was in 2009, though. There had been many. <laughs> yeah, some of us did. Okay, and it's not just <laughs> that they put themselves inside the crate. It's that they nailed themselves inside the crate so that they could, like, blast through the wood in more impactful fashion. <laughs> so, I mean, it has to be more dramatic. Yeah, exactly. Of course, yeah. I don't understand what your point is, Heath. <laughs> <laughs> did they show us what actually happened or what they were planning when they showed us that they showed us both of the things but yeah i think that was what actually happened i think they nailed them in their coffin style yeah and then remember in the fantasy they blasted out of it but in actuality a gentleman of mexican descent he ran into something and the box just fell and then they jumped up and were like, aha, perfectly still yeah. holding shooting. Yeah, it right. turns out we could have just walked in here and shot you guys. But yeah. Also, yeah. that crate was full of heroin. So they got just crazy high on heroin and then popped out of a box and started <laughs> shooting. That explains the flashback. Yeah, obviously. honestly, yeah, yeah, right. them, them being on heroin explains a ton of this fucking movie. It all takes place in their apartment. You know, <laughs> me so, being on heroin explains a ton of this fucking movie. Well, Troy Duffy being on heroin explains this whole movie. I wanted Romeo to just drive the forklift up and they're just like asleep inside. And he's like, oh, OK, heroin. I thought they were going to pop out there. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Out of heroin. Is that heroin in there? Did yeah. you guys have crates of heroin? <laughs> yeah. So but we're cutting between them doing the, the crime and her like reconstructing it with her just fucking tour of the south accent right she's in mississippi <laughs> she's in texas she's antebellum it just it, everywhere you go it's different every sentence <laughs> yeah absolutely it's like me trying to do a mean impersonation of lucinda without her overhearing it <laughs> 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 all right so so the boys go to see that stuttering bartender from the first one fuck ass fuck ass, oh, fuck ass. man uh, none of it holds up and if you don't have that reaction then nothing in this scene is uh is gonna do it for you <laughs> okay first of all his name is doc okay yep. Yep. <laughs> wasn't he a muppet the actor yeah I think I th he was i think he was wait a minute oh my god Doc the muppet <laughs> yeah what yeah. yeah he's like a really good actor Sadly, this is like the last the movie, last he, movie ever he ever in. made. Yeah. Oh, no. I hate to have like a big argument with you on uh, right in the middle of the thing. But no one whose acting career contains this movie is actually a really good actor. William, <laughs> William Dafoe is a really good fucking actor. It's yeah, really not, it's a sad no, fucking. Yeah. He's, he this is. He is. Billy Connolly is. This movie. <laughs> they just, they just, they just brings the average all down. The Oscar yeah. nomination staff. Yeah, it's like yeah. if you get an F on one paper, even though the rest of your class <laughs> yeah. work is really good. <laughs> So we get this, they go and see fuck ass and they have a drinking montage. And I just, I love this moment because it, there's one moment where one of the brothers is holding a lobster as though it is his penis, chasing the other brother around and he yells lobster dick. And I'm watching this with the, with the subtitles on. So I just stopped that and I captured that frame and I'm like, that's the entire movie right there. <laughs> 
There it is. With the words yep. lobster dick in the subtitle. <laughs> See, I thought during that scene, that's the bottom surgery I should have gotten. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know y'all could do crustaceans. Hold on a second. Yeah. I, <laughs> how many claws am I allowed to get total? Yeah. <laughs> Give Ted Cruz something to be afraid of, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that one, Callie, he's justified of being afraid of. Callie. <laughs> yeah. So to be clear, Doc had lobsters ready for like eight years for them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And now Enjoying. he has Absolutely. them ready. So they're having lobsters. I mean, he might serve lobster at the bar. You don't know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, maybe maybe it's just like a normal thing he always has. I like sure. Irish bars and lobster. Those two things go yes. together. Go well. together. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and Bushmills, Irish whiskey, false. They would have Jameson. This is, these are Catholics, yeah. whatever. Dumb. All right, so yeah, they're they're drinking and having fun with lobster dicks and everything, and then we cut to Billy Connolly. He's going to bring the whole thing to a grinding fucking halt. Everybody was having fun. He's got a shit on it with a flashback to 1958. He's sitting in the chair, looking very somberly, wondering if he's really being paid enough. <laughs> <laughs> also, can I just say... They definitely weren't dressed for 1958. They're somewhere between The Godfather 2 and like a musical of guys and dolls, but definitely not 1958 (laughs) attire. Everybody looks like Geppetto in this scene. (laughs) Yep. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. What year's Geppetto from? So, (laughs) So, yeah. So apparently back in the day, Billy Connolly was a furniture maker in New York City, and his dad was just a kindly old feller until the gangsters came to kill him for all the kindliness. They killed him with a hammer. And look, like, I know they're trying to establish, like, (gasps) trauma, like this horrible, tragic backstory, except killing someone with a hammer takes too long to create dramatic tension because they're like, whack, whack. Oh, whack, fuck. Whack. I guess it really matters where you Stop. hit him. It does. I just yeah. thought. Stop killing my dad. Oh my God. All right. Just let me do it. Oh my God. You guys are the worst. <laughs> Stop taking a Gatorade break from killing my dad. <laughs> so, and then this is where we're also going to meet Romeo's uncle Caesar, who will just basically pop in here and there to tell him where the next action sequence is going to take place. Yeah. I wonder if there's going to be racist jokes in this scene. <laughs> <laughs> that is the only reason this scene could exist. Like, you ever watch another movie and they, they linger on an older actor for too long and you're like, I don't know why this scene's in the movie. And then you Google it and you're like, oh, Uncle Caesar was played by the first prime minister of Estonia. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> That's what this scene is, except there is no point in this actor is not anybody special. <laughs> except. We do take the time for him and his uncle to have a weird whisper fight about respect in the middle of this movie. Yeah. Yeah, they ha- they're having this little fight in Spanish and then the brothers are like, "Yeah, we speak Spanish. You're having a messy fight right now. You guys want to <laughs> just take it outside?" Yeah, and I feel like Troy Duffy felt like he was being very clever there because he's like, "Ooh, the audience knows that they speak this language and there's like <laughs> right. this tension thing." And I feel like <laughs> That whole thing just read to me like Troy Duffy felt he was being very, very clever. Oh, he fucking nailed it. He high-fived yeah. himself and came when he wrote this. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 But we learned here that they need to find Gorgeous George, who is a character we haven't met to this point, who will be honestly the main character for the next, I don't know, 25 minutes, more or less. And at this point, I'm desperately hoping that we're going to get the flamboyant gay rep we're missing from the first movie. <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> um, depending on how problematic you like your representation, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, yeah and this is Uncle Caesar's whole point here. He's like, "Yeah, I'll find gorgeous George for you. That that'll be my role here." And they're like, "Can you just if you can find? Can you find us the final boss?" Yeah, like, no, <laughs> no, 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 mid boss. No, you got to build it. You did the warm up with the Chinese gang, and then you build it. Medium boss. That's George. <laughs> We're not in Act Three yet. Sorry. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So, okay, so now we're going to meet George and we're going to meet him with Eunice, the FBI agent coming in to to have a talk with him, right? So he's at this massage parlor. She comes in and she like flashes her badge and the message she's trying to send is you walk away, massage therapist, whatever. I'm going to sneak in and, and do your job yeah, and pretend I'm you. And like very clearly the per- the woman doing the massage is like, I don't get what you're trying to 
say here. So there's Why this would, long. Does this not happen a lot? Moment. I feel like we cop and show up for these moments yeah. all the time, and we do a thing. It's there's the sign. And then you. This is the problem. We started letting cops commandeer vehicles, and now they just walk into your pizza parlor <laughs> and start fucking running that for you. Yeah. So she does the sign, Eunice Bloom, and now she's doing the massage on gorgeous George, and he doesn't know right away. And then she pulls out a giant, like a pizza scooping giant yep, pizza paddle. peel. Yep. Yep. That is bejeweled. Beju- yes. Yeah. A bejeweled. With, with yes. A lot of texture and slaps his ass as like a big announce like impactful <laughs> surprise announcement that she's there so as this is happening i was like okay did she bring that paddle <laughs> <laughs> oh god i hope i catch him with his ass out guys if i catch him with his ass out <laughs> yeah i thought it might be a massage thing too and i so i i did some <laughs> like extensive pausing and I paused it right on like when they show one side of the paddle and it says the name of the massage parlor on it. So it's a thing they have at the massage parlor. Well, there you go. Huh. Oh, oh, so I was just going to say I carry one of those with me everywhere. Well, so yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, so it's, <laughs> yeah. it's both. I have maybe. one hanging yeah. over my door. Yeah. I mean, she was yeah. like, oh, I brought my own. Oh, oh, oh I like yeah, no, yours. It's, it's you're landed. Just, yeah. <laughs> and I, I should point out that at this point in the movie, it, they engage in some pretty extensive fat shaming, but like. Not of that fat a character, <laughs> right? What's weird about this scene and the rest of the scenes with Gorgeous George is they will constantly harp on how fat he is, but he's just like dad bod chub. Yeah, I mean, maybe I'm even... like crazily obese. Yeah, he's like he's like average size, like very average right, size. Right, like like they, like there was a fat guy that was supposed to do this bit, and he walked out. He's like, no, I'm not gonna do it. He's just spanking my ass with the thing. I'm not even branded properly. And then so they got this guy at the last minute, and they're like, okay, we got a lot of ah, oh, we're gonna have to take out all the black jokes. I can't take those out and the overweight jokes, man. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, but so she interrogates gorgeous George for a minute and explains to him that he is main character bait. She's like, I know you think (laughs) that you're act three shit, but you're not even all the way to the end of act two. Uh, You're you're a mid boss. And I feel like she specifically says the thing about cannoli and shrimp cocktail, because we're supposed to think that makes her smart because we saw cannoli and shrimp cocktail earlier. Wow. You're right. Oh, she's (laughs) so smart. She could even tell. Yeah. 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 That's, that is some deep that. storytelling. <laughs> <laughs> There's this amazing Troy Duffy moment here, too, where as she's about to leave, she goes, you have a pretty nice ass for a fat man. And then she leaves. And like, I get that they're trying to do the Willem Dafoe thing here. But like the bit about Willem Dafoe saying stuff like that in the first movie is that Willem Dafoe was gay and that was the joke. Right. But now that she's a woman, she just occasionally says insane things like an alien. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, well, and now, and then we get after her interrogation of gorgeous George, we have to get his uh, interrogation from the brothers, from the main characters, yep. which we're going to do in a tanning salon where he's in tiny, tiny little underwear the whole time. Mm, yeah. <laughs> He was in apparently a European cut of underwear is what they said. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is that? Am I wearing like an American cut? How do I know? I don't know what you're wearing. You can't (laughs) ask us. Podcasts aren't made with video, buddy. (laughs) Everybody, please hop on Skype. (laughs) I have a question. Damn it. This is why Zencaster created a video function, right? (laughs) So exactly. We could tell Heath what video, what his cut of his underwear was. I mean, personally, I think those bottoms are flattering. So, Heath, if you wanted to, I'm just saying. Like, yeah. yeah, you're saying I should go European. Go, cut, go Europe. I, I'm, I'm saying not. if you're not yeah. going European, you should be. Yeah, right. absolutely. Because right. you're sophisticated, okay. Heath. You're sophisticated. Mm-hmm. Socialist right. underwear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got to share it with a bunch of people. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, yeah. So, the, the brothers show up while he's tanning at the salon. And we spend an inordinate amount of time with the... I got so scared I shit myself jokes. Oh, it's what a horror. Oh. What a hell. Yeah. It's just like it, we, we might as well zoom in on a close up of his actual rectum extruding a fear <laughs> shit for the rest of this movie. And Troy Duffy's in the front like Snoke popping up in Mortal Kombat being like, is this what you want? Please no. give me the money for more drugs, please. <laughs> 
oh, it's so fucking bad. And it, like, honestly, there's a part of me, whenever we see these movies that we watch, like Adam Sandler movies for the bonus episode or whatever, I think to myself, there was a time when I could have just sat in a writer's room yelling poop and had, you know, 60, 70 grand a year. Yeah. It's just, mm-hmm. I don't, it's, I'm, it's sad. It's yeah. sad. Poop. It's, 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 the time has passed. And we would have done it. Yeah, classic. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, like rebrand, rebrands happen. Yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Kelly. I swear to God, if you name your show Poop Splitting before we get to it, this friendship is over. <laughs> Registering over. that right now. <laughs> oh wow! Do, um, don't don't go don't go to Poop Splitting. Oh, God. I'm gonna yeah. Do to, not go oh, to poopsplitting.com. <laughs> I do not want to have to buy that on Google domains. <laughs> There's only so many things you can explain to your baby when he grows up. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna be quiet for the next ten minutes. So something. okay. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, but fucking gorgeous George shits his European cut underwear and then agrees to help them set up a bunch of Yakovetta's guys. Yeah. yeah still medium level. Yeah. They're building it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So then we check back in on the cop stooges and they introduce this rosary thing. Does this ever matter? It never it does not. At it all. never matters. And one of the reasons why it never matters, which is so heartbreaking, is that they will spend, I'm going to say 20 minutes of this movie being like, who is the guy who killed the priest? And then the way we actually meet this character is he just shows up where the saints are and is like, hi, it doesn't matter if you knew who I was at all or right. if anyone ever found out who <laughs> right. I was. Yes, exactly. He starts firing a gun and they're like, rosary yeah. bead? We did a thing? With the, we spent like 20 minutes. It doesn't matter. You're shooting. Okay. <laughs> Fucking Miss Marple's just sitting there next to Daniel Craig and fucking. <laughs> <laughs> That's not how a mystery's constructed. Oh, yeah. it's so bad because like she even has the like comes back in and she's like, no, I just realized he would have taken off his gloves when he did this and we would have had his print under this and of that and blah blah blah. And it's just like, yeah, but again, like it's not like you're gonna use that to then identify his weakness or anything. Yeah, it's like she no. was revealing it so the movie would know. Who they <laughs> oh, no, this is just Troy Duffy changing some of the words of the original script, but he left the thing where it was like, it looks like we got ourselves a cowboy. So she's like, you took off your gloves, cowboy. Why would it say cowboy there? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I don't know. But then they like try to try to recover that. And we just see weird killer guy who's short, apparently. He's mad that the priest he just murdered is taller than him. So yep. he lays down next to the priest who's dead to check the height difference and then check the hand size difference. And he needed to take off his gloves for that. Yeah. Why? And that will never be relevant to the movie. I mean, look, I do the same thing every time he falls asleep after a live show. Well, well, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just, yeah, of course. Yeah. Later, I was like, okay, do you touch I get hands it. with me while I'm sleeping. Yeah, every time. I, Whose but hands I was are like, bigger? Mine. Really? <laughs> yeah. So much bigger. Twice mm, as big. Everybody hop on Skype, please. <laughs> <laughs> everybody tap on high hand Skype, which <laughs> reveals your hands to exact proportions. I knew we installed this for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> Again, hold a quarter next to your hand right now. I want to see it. Today's newspaper. He's serial killing because, well, not serial killing. He's single priest killing because he wants to lure out the brothers because, spoiler alert, the father's old ally has hired him because if he lures out the brothers, the brothers will go. And if the brothers are there, the father will also go for some reason. So this whole his obsession with his height thing only makes sense if we had that 50 years where short people weren't allowed to vote. That's the only possibility. Yes, Yes, absolutely. It's such a fucking mess. (laughs) And then, okay, so we go to this setup, right, where they're going to get Yakovetta's guys. We literally, the establishing shot for this fucking scene is a close-up on the shit stain of George's European cut underwear. That's where we are now. So close to my rectum joke. (laughs) Ten years, guys. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's been a minute since we've called attention to that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a very good point. Yeah. It's been so, 10 years writing this. I also like, and this is a side note, I love that Dennis Nedry is at the bar ordering oh, is he? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not actually him, but I swear to fucking Christ. Oh, okay. <laughs> 
So, yeah, so all the bad guys are getting their meals and stuff, waiting for the big setup and everything. I love that they try to, like, establish these characters are bad guys because they're all being mean and racist to Romeo. And it's like, yeah, but so are the good guys, though. Everybody is doing that. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> and to prove that point, Romeo goes to the back and they're, he's like, yeah, those guys are being awful racist to me. And they're like, slur. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All those slur people are saying slur things. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, but all the bad guys show up. They wheel George out so that they strap into this cart. They wheel him out so everybody will look left. But then they show up from right. Okay. I went to a king party once where there was that. I feel like they got that from a party I went to. Really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Shit Just want to add a few more details and see if the party still seems the same to you. The Saints have painted... An Irish saint, <laughs> Aaron Gabra, Ireland forever, on George's ass or back. Mm -hmm. And they've duct taped him to like, you know, a, a cart that you would move dishes in a restaurant in. And then they, they roll him out. Like so much effort and planning into just like this tiny diversion that could have been absolutely anything. Yeah, it just the noise would have done it. Yeah. So circling back, uh, did that resemble the party? Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. 100%. Moment for moment, word for word. But <laughs> I, I want to point out the weird, like, Troy Duffy desperately trying to hit me and Heath's hometown Irish fan service of Aaron Gobra. Because you got to remember, they're not doing this for Irish reasons, right? Nope. They're doing this for vigilante murder reasons. So they might as well have written, go Yankees and is it TGIF <laughs> a nicer restaurant when you really think about it on the guy's back? <laughs> I would I would have been excited for those. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Ah. Uh. And in 2009, you were excited for Aaron Gobra. We don't need to lie to ourselves. I, okay. It's not, it, it, I am moving on. So, <laughs> so George is my favorite part here, though, is they roll him out there and then they're doing the, the action scene, but like in the background, cause the, the diversion doesn't matter anymore. No, nope. but his, his stupid rolling table falls over and you watch him, the actor very clearly hurt himself because oh, he's yes. to it. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they show it to you again in slow motion, which is great. But I, I, I do want to point out, again, the entirety of this action sequence is the two brothers step out, each with a gun in either hand, and just shoot all the bad guys to death. Yep. That's it. They don't move or reload their guns or just mm -mm. it really makes you appreciate John Wick when you see shit like this. <laughs> How far we've come. Yeah. And not just because John Wick never calls someone a slur. Although that is a part of it. It's certainly <laughs> a part of it. So, yeah, so they kill all those guys. But just then, just as they're counting all their unhatched chickens, the priest killer short bad guy shows up. But so does Eunice at the very same second. And so he shoots at them, but then she shoots at him and he runs away. Good thing we set him up as a character, huh? <laughs> <laughs> they just happen to have the same appointment in their Google calendar for the, yeah. the shootout. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I made it a public event. That's why she showed oh, up at the same yeah, time. That's going to be it. I got to separate those calendars out. OPSEC, guys. OPSEC. So, <laughs> so yeah. So, but but this is where the, the brothers learn that she's friends with Paul Smecker, Willem Dafoe. They have a little flashback to somebody putting a flower on his grave. They're like, no, it's not that he didn't like us and wouldn't be in the movie. It's that he died. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he didn't say I almost got an Oscar for Antichrist and kicked me in the ball. So when I get to his house, he was just <laughs> he was busy, <laughs> busy he this was weekend. Fishing. Yeah. <laughs> but the key is that she's on their side and she'll help them clean up the crime scene. And I'm just like, it doesn't matter. Like, you're already wanted for murder. Yeah. And again, yeah. I hate to keep going into the mind of Troy Duffy because seriously, who fucking cares? But like, the thing about the first movie is Willem Dafoe is trying to catch them, trying to catch them, trying to catch them. And then at the climax of the movie decides, you know what? I'm going to be on their side. But because Troy Duffy knew that people liked that ish of the movie, she, for no reason, is just like, yeah, I've been pretending to try to catch you, but now I'm going to stop pretending to do that and instead work with you the entire time. Why haven't I been doing that from the beginning? Go fuck yourself. Troy Duffy would like more coke. <laughs> <laughs> that, if you ever have a question, yeah, that was the answer. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so we have a quick montage of them cleaning up the crime scene and then we cut to her investigating it. 
and coming up with a far more interesting action sequence that this could have come from. Yeah, and, but it, it's supposed to be, again, that like slow-mo listening to music. She's genius because she figures it out, but she just says like, okay, here's what happens. The bad guys all shot each other. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm a genius. <laughs> That's her whole explanation. Apropos of nothing, Troy Duffy would like more Coke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then this, this is also where they learn that, you know, somebody even higher up than Yakaveta must be pulling the strings. She's like, wow, it looks like there's a main, main bad guy. As if the stakes <laughs> in the movie weren't already high enough. Right? <laughs> hey, man. She might as well turn to camera. I assure you, this movie thinks it is about something. <laughs> <laughs> it is about Troy Duffy wanting more cocaine. More cocaine. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> If you pop open your DVD player and just dump in a half gram, we'd really appreciate it. <laughs> It'll come back here to home base. So, yeah. So, and, and keep in mind that the entire, through the entire movie up to this point, we've had the, the three Stooges cops, Greeny and Greenlee and Duffy. Duffy, thank you. They've been like trying to hide shit from her because they don't want her to know that they're actually on the same side as the main character brothers. And everything, but she's on their side. She was the whole time and knew this about them. So they have to like explain that away. And she's like, they're like, well, why didn't you just tell Greenlee and Duffy that you were on their side? She's like, ah, I'm just kind of fucking with them. And like, really? Just fucking with them. There's, just, there's murders yeah. and shit. It's not often that I look <laughs> at a movie and I go, ah, oh, I wish this had been written as well as now you see me. <laughs> that was a fun movie. Whatever. <laughs> But yeah, but now all the good guys can get together. So Greenlee and Duffy and Eunice and everybody, they all go to the bar where the brothers are hiding out. And they start discussing what the next big action sequence is going to be. Yeah. And the brothers are hiding behind the bar when Greenlee and Duffy walk in. <laughs> and they, their big thing is like, surprise! And they spray them with the soda gun. And one of them falls over because of the soda gun. Because it's <laughs> so powerful. I enjoyed that moment. I love the idea that your big thing is going to like is going to be to sneak up on armed men and say surprise and hit them with, you know, seltzer guns. That's good. Classic. They start pulling out their guns and firing. <laughs> okay. Oh, fuck. All right. Oh, my Dude, bad. Guys. Everyone my somehow bad. shoots the Mexican guy. Ah, <laughs> wow. Everybody just immediately shot. He wasn't even spraying you. It was us. So we sprayed you. You all ran outside and shot a black kid playing with a toy gun on 11th Street. It was oh. really weird. Yeah. Boston. Yeah, so they, they all chatted up. Stooge number two brags about how testicular his testicles are <laughs> at length. <laughs> Jesus Christ at this movie. Did we all want to fuck each other and not have the courage to say it from <laughs> like 1980 to 2007 and then like we legalized gay marriage and just all of us homophobes casually went off to Maine somewhere and got married. <laughs> and that's why fiction and movies have changed the way it has. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, yeah. You just explained the, uh, the entire decade of action movies. Yeah. That and Troy Duffy's cocaine. <laughs> yep. yep. Just a bunch of happily married gay screenwriters somewhere. <laughs> and, and this is, this is where we get the phrase fucking sacomatic. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Which is. <laughs> Oh, pin God. in that ten yeah, pin in, pin years, in. <laughs> guys. Oh, it was like a pin in that. I'll tell you, it was just like putting a pin in that. Yeah. <laughs> and Callie, if you ever feel bad, keep in mind somewhere out there, someone has sacomatic tattoo. On their body. <laughs> <laughs> Is it worse if it's unrelated or related? To this movie? <laughs> I can't tell. So. Oh, what do they call it when two people come up with the same thing at the same time? But separately? Yeah. Independent <laughs> creation. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's uh That's some amazing consistency. It's a brilliant idea. So it's it's the next step in yeah, uh, right, right. testicular humor. Yeah. Okay. Callie leveling up. All right. Yeah. So <laughs> so meanwhile, we cut back over to Judd Nelson. He doesn't even know what the fuck the plot is anymore, right? He's just running around yelling bad guy words kind of at random. Well, <laughs> I mean, yeah, bad guy words, but also Troy Duffy learned the word reconnoiter and he put this scene just to say reconnoiter once. 100%. <laughs> Absolutely. I feel like the slur words were also part of his motivation, but okay. The whole yeah. point. 
Yeah, I was I was thinking because when the the old guy's talking, you can very much tell that they like re-recorded that in the studio because the mouth movements do not match at all. Oh, really? And I thought like, and I thought like, oh yeah, he even Troy Duffy has given up at this point. But when I heard the word reconnoiter, I was like, okay, never mind. They are yeah. So, so Judd Nelson tried to say reconnoiter a bunch of times, and didn't even come close. And they were like, well, I don't know. We'll, we'll fix fucking it ADR post. that it, later. God yeah. damn it! I'm convinced yeah. this whole scene was just Judd Nelson yelling at his agent about being in this movie, <laughs> and they were like, it's fine. We'll ADR in later. It's some it's bad it's guy it's monologue. <laughs> All right, well, I'll tell you what. We've got Judd Nelson's assurances that an action movie is going to break out any minute now, so we're going to take another quick break. But first, let me get back through the hard sell. Can this movie fulfill its quota of anti-gay slurs in time? Will they even have time for anti-Asian slurs? What about them filthy Belarusians? Find out the answers to these questions and more when we return for the hate crime palooza conclusion of Boondock Saints 2, All Saints Day. Dude, you're hogging it. No, I am not. You guys got like four minutes before I even got here. Hey, fellas, you uh, ready to record? Yeah, sorry, Callie. We were just washing the taste of this movie out of our mouths. By kissing a spaceship? Oh, yeah, I can see why you would think that because of its sleek modern design. But this is the new mouthwash from Quip. Quip? Like the electric toothbrush people? That's right. Quip mouthwash kills bad breath, germs, and helps prevent cavities and leaves you feeling fresh thanks to a formula that gives your mouth everything it needs and nothing it doesn't. Your four times concentrate has fluoride, xylitol, and CPC, and they left out the artificial colors and stinging alcohol you'll find in a lot of other rinses. And Quip's refillable mouthwash is good for your mouth and the planet. With a four times concentrated formula, Quip ships less water and more good for you ingredients. Each eco-friendly refill replaces a big, bulky 470 milliliter bottle from one of those other brands once diluted. And Quip's refill bottles are made from 100% recyclable plastic. Plus, you can add a mouthwash refill plan and make sure your rinse never runs out. With a customizable subscription, you can get refills automatically delivered straight to your door every three months. You can stay on top of your swish without lugging any any bottles home from the store. How refreshing. That's right. And if you go to getquip.com slash awful five right now, you can get $5 off a mouthwash starter kit. That's $5 off a mouthwash starter kit, which includes a refillable dispenser and a 90 dose supply of Quip's four time concentrated formula at getquip.com slash awful five spelled G E T Q U I P dot com slash awful five quip the good habits company. All right. Actually, you mind if I get in on that? I just remembered literally every line of dialogue from this movie. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I don't, don't remember the movie. Don't remember the movie. Bad. Boss, they hit our cocaine warehouse. Damn it. These ass fuckers are fucking us in the ass again. You said it, boss. For sure. Look, I want you to call the best hitters on the East Coast. We need these ass fuckers dead because they are fucking our asses like our asses have never been fucked before. Right. Sure. I'm, tra- yeah. I'm talking about right. like we met on Grind and did a will want won't list and just went to town on each other levels of ass fucking. Okay. Uh, and boss- so then we traded numbers, you know, just in case we wanted to hook up again. But then all of a sudden it wasn't about the sex anymore. We were getting lunch together. We discovered how much we had in common. And before you knew it, we realized that the hole we were trying to fill in ourselves wasn't our ass, but our heart. This is the boondock. And then bam, before you know it, you're moving in what? together. I mean, with the rents the way they are, it only makes sense. And then on your trip to Paris, he pops the question and you're happier than you ever thought you'd be again. Uh, boss? Yeah, Muggsy. Are you in a gay relationship that you're trying to tell us about? No, this is an analogy of how you should kill the boondock saints. Okay. Oh, okay, yeah, for sure. Yeah, we'll kill them. Got it. I love you, Gerald. Hmm? I nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back for still more of this shit. And we're going to rejoin our heroes at the underground gun store that every movie has and every protagonist <laughs> can afford. Yeah. And this guy like expanded his business of his secret gun basement thing. He's like yeah. franchised. He's got mall kiosks. But yeah, <laughs> his his merchandising skills have very much improved. I was impressed. <laughs> do, you, do you guys want some of these Saints bobbleheads I've been selling? <laughs> I can't keep them on the shelves. 
I made Funko Pops. There's beach towels. Yeah, he even explains to us. He's basically like, yeah, well, you know, this is the sequel, so it has to be bigger this time. You guys were very good for business. And I almost went with best, worst, disappointing gun reveal because they start to pick out guns. (laughs) And he's like, no, no, for you, boys, you get the good ones. And they open it. It's like, oh, right. Marcellus Wallace's soul is in there. (laughs) And then they take them out and they're just like, Slightly longer guns. <laughs> they're so, yeah. but they're, they're so much less impressive than the guns on the wall. Right, yeah. like the normal sales. There are like fully automatic machine guns everywhere, and yeah, and they just he, he gives them essentially the same guns they have with you know squared off silencers instead of rounded ones. And I feel like there's like a little red dot that's like a logo or something on them that's different. Maybe. Also, I, I would say this is a sexual moment because. The music comes on and the music <laughs> says, we're going to fuck these guns. Oh, yeah, right? absolutely. Abs- yeah. They're going to fuck those guns. 100%. Yeah. These are the guns that Marvin Gaye's dad shot him with is the music. <laughs> <laughs> so and then Romeo shows up. He's like, oh, I found a great sidekick gun as well. And I was definitely wondering where Romeo was up to this point. Yeah, <laughs> I missed him a lot. <laughs> so, so he pulls out his guns. Now, of course, he's the sidekick and he's Mexican. So the guns have to be over the top Mexican. And I guarantee you that's all Duffy wrote right in the script. It says like, you know, Romeo opens box. Guns are over the top Mexican. Yeah, it's <laughs> and, so stupid. And then he's like, did the brightly colored phallic things in my hands make me look gay? <laughs> <laughs> Do they make guns by nation? Clearly. Yeah, yeah, you can get yeah, the whole set obviously. for every country that you that you go to that you visit. Yeah, I mean you these get... guns were inside of a chalupa. Those yes. are Mexican guns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair. fair. Well, and it's and, and what's funny is that he pulls out the guns and he's like, I got these guns. Look, they have Mexican flags on the handles. That's all we could think of. And the brothers don't look too impressed. He's like, wait a minute, are you saying I look gay? And I'm like, why is that immediately where you went, man? Why would you think that the guns are commenting on your sexuality? I don't oh, understand. Oh, man, if only we could have gotten the trope of nationalism equaling gay, we could have taken oh, care of a lot yeah. of America's problems <laughs> yeah. with the boondock saints, too. <laughs> All right, so... Then we get uh, Eunice walking through another crime scene in her accent of many colors. This is a crime. This is an action sequence we haven't seen yet because it's this dumb fucking movie. Yeah, right. This is also where Agent Cuntler shows up. Yes. Cuntler. Uh, Come on. Yeah. Cuntler. Cuntler. Yeah. Sorry. It's much better wordplay than I was giving you yes. credit for. <laughs> and he suspends her and like. Why did he watch the rest of the movie? So what's amazing is what's happening here is that Troy Duffy knows that this is the part of the movie where the feds have to take over the investigation, but she's already a fed, right? So he's like, oh, fuck, that won't work. Fuck it. I'll do it anyway. Yeah. Right. So the feds come and take the investigation over from the feds. (laughs) <laughs> and then we find out that assisting in mass murder only gets you suspended, which is like one of the few realistic <laughs> things in this movie, right? <laughs> I also love that moment where there's like, they're like looking at each other very seriously, saying funny versions of each other's name. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just, <laughs> he's like, hello, Bloomy. And she's like, hello, cunty. <laughs> And he's like, fuck, I walked right into that. Oh, yeah, that's so that easy. I should know that my name has Come on, your name's Kunstler? You didn't you didn't yeah. see that coming? If it's your name's probably- Kunstler, you just do you go straight with everyone's name always for all time. <laughs> you call her Eunice there. And again, I can I can definitely see like Troy Duffy sitting in front of his computer. He takes a long drag from a cigarette and you just hear Kunstler. <laughs> <laughs> And then you hear him dial his cocaine guy. Yeah, right, right, exactly. <laughs> well, I love too. So Kunstler says to her, he's like, you're off the case. And she's like, fine, fine. But you know what? I'm going to narrate that fucking action sequence first. And then I'm off the case. <laughs> right. It's as though the script forgot the order of the script. Just like, ah, <laughs> oh, shit, this scene would have been better. In, after after you're done. Yeah, ah. whoops. Damn it. So, yeah, so we we cut to the action sequence with her narrating. The good guys sneak in in a giant laundry cart. I'm thinking to myself, if I'm a bad guy, if I am ever running a bad guy thing, I'm just going to use small laundry carts, right? That saves you a ton of trouble. (laughs) Huge. They 100% did this for the visual of the Mexican guy doing the housekeeping disguise. (laughs) Yep, exactly. 100%. (laughs) And then we get what is, I'm going to say, my favorite 
but also one of the weirdest parts of the movie, which is where Romeo has kidnapped a random janitor Mm -hmm. and is making him workshop taglines with him. Another replay of a kink party I went to once. (laughs) (laughs) It's weird that that has happened twice. You went to a tagline kink party? Oh, Heath! It's, Heath, it's your dream. That. Yeah, right. Yeah, you've been trading for this your whole fucking life. <laughs> this is a wordplay slash sexual oh, party. You're the Mr. Hands of a wordplay kink party. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what Mr. Hands means, but yeah, probably that sounds. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that's okay. Accurate. Heath, yeah, he doesn't know what Mr. Hands means. Everybody, <laughs> so, liar. My hands are bigger than yours. So and <laughs> yeah, no. So so they're all like zeroing in on Judd Nelson, right? Who they think is the main bad guy at this point. And luckily for them, he's been in this panic room the entire time, the entire movie, but he steps out right before the action sequence to give everybody another bad guy pep talk. Hello, everyone. I've just been informed I'm not the final bad guy of the movie, so I'm going to make it easier for the brothers to kill me. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I mean, you know, gangsters are known for their... Skill at motivational speeches. Yeah, right. No, exactly. Exactly. And his has a lot of ass fucking in it, right? Of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, don't yours? Yeah, well, I I want people motivated, don't I? So, and and then the brothers have decided that their way in on this is that they're going to take, they're going to get to the roof of the building and then climb down with a, like a window washing scaffold with rope, yeah. rope. Well, and then yeah, yeah then, fucking rope. And then yeah, because the thing breaks, they have to repel it in. Because remember, yeah, rope thing from that, before? that entire scene exists I, so, for a bad callback. <laughs> is, yeah. is it? Oh, okay. I had no idea why the hell we, we did all this some compl- fucking rope, and they yes. nailed it. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yes, because Troy Duffy was like had a whiteboard, a sad, sad whiteboard <laughs> behind him that had the title "Things People Liked About My First Movie," and at the center of it was "Rope Jokes?" Question <laughs> mark. <laughs> and then, very small next to it was written "Note to Self: More Cocaine." <laughs> All right, and so we get to the actual action sequence part. This is one of the ones that Eunice is going to walk through with us in slow motion and everything. She's dressed as a cowboy at this point, which is super hot. Yeah, if I ever go to a mass murder scene, I'm definitely taking two outfits. Fuck yeah. Uh (laughs) Fuck yeah. And what's great is they've got her doing some gun spinning, but what's fun about gun spinning is it's really awesome for two seconds and it's super boring and dumb for three. So they do seven <laughs> seconds of gun yes. spinning. Okay. All right. I'm just going to point out like this is the most entertaining. We have a sexy woman spinning guns. Well, not really, but it's like somebody spinning guns with the sexy woman is superimposed. On that, like th- this is the high point of the film. They, they could have yeah, gone on with this for another seventeen minutes, and I would have been happy. Also, one other thing on that giant vision board of Troy Duffy's was there was a firefight because everybody fucking loved that. Yeah. Oh so yeah. He tried to rewrite it here, but so badly. <laughs> yeah. So she says there was a good old fashioned shoot 'em up. <laughs> <laughs> Through her portable reverb machine. <laughs> oh God, I didn't even know what they were going for. But yeah, okay, that now that line kind of makes yeah. sense. Wow. Mm-hmm. I mean, it makes sense in context. Well, right, right, right. Yeah, like by the, the yeah. by the internal logic of <laughs> Troy Duffy's cocaine. Yeah, yeah. So I, my only note on this scene is gun gunning with guns. Yeah, right. my note was I'm just picturing the writer in his house making gun noises while some terrified <laughs> intern types PQ PQ. <laughs> <laughs> and we see them do their repelling thing here mm-hmm. as she's telling the story and they smash in through the glass of, you know, the floor a few below where they started. And that's where all the bad guys, Judd Nelson, you can't just break the glass wall on the exterior of a building like that, can you? You can't just like kick it in. If you're the good guy, you can. I mean, if you shoot a bullet through it first. Yeah. I just wanted them to slam into the glass and just be like, oh, oh. all right. <laughs> all right. Just once I want a good guy to like go to slam through and then just it just slowly squeak his way down <laughs> 30 stories. Bugs Bunny. Yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, but they kill everybody. They they kill Judd Nelson. Like, again, we've spent the entire movie setting him up as a character. He just gets shot. Oh, oh no, they do the stupid fucking prayer execution thing with him, don't they? Of course. Yeah. yeah. When and this this is he's on his way into the panic room, and one of the henchmen like shoulder checks him out of the way. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. I wanted him to just like jump in with the rest of the poem before he gets shot. He's just like, yeah, Patrick Feely's spirit is not. Just fucking shoot me. Come yeah, on. So every you know, the first one has been. We hurry it up. It's undoing their magic. Spell the armor. Stop <laughs> yeah. it. You're ruining our whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead again. Finish, finish your poem. Go ahead. Oh, to thee, my spirit lord. Spirit of Santi. Ah, right. you ruined it. <laughs> so, and then, of course, we get to hear the workshop tagline that, that Romeo has, which is, um, Ding dong, motherfucker. <laughs> I personally preferred whoop ass fajitas. Yeah, I'm who ordered just, the whoop I mean, ass fajitas? That yeah. was way better. Yeah, but way better. that wasn't really his line. They they gave him a do over and he came up with ding yeah. dong, motherfucker. Yeah, which the, the brothers are very impressed with. Yeah. Yeah. Which means that Troy Duffy wrote two takes for himself at a catchphrase and then wrote characters being like, you're a good writer, Troy Duffy. You should yep. reward yourself <laughs> with some more cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> he also wrote a scene of him coming up with that, but with a character workshopping it. Yeah. Which was really <laughs> <a lot>. <laughs> <laughs> Troy Duffy had a guy in a closet duct tape to a <laughs> furniture dolly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but just as Eunice has finished defoeing her way through this crime scene, the panic room opens up and that sidekick guy that shoulder checked him out of the way jumps out and grabs her and, 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 and brings her in. This is a, a feign at a plot point. Yeah, yeah. But, they tried. Like that speech you just gave. That's fucking exactly what happened in real life. I don't know how. You, are you wearing a cowgirl outfit? <laughs> <laughs> Change into that for the speech. Aren't you suspended? None of this makes sense. Whatever. It, you nailed it. You nailed the movie. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He just explains to her that okay. Yeah. So you guys are probably. I mean, it's we're in the Act Three. You're going to need to know who the main bad guy is. He's the old man. That's the real main bad guy. Now that you've killed Judd Nelson, that the, the, the old man all along. <laughs> does he have a uh, like really cool badass nickname? He does. He does. Thank you for asking. He's the Roman. Really? That's what you got. You got uh, it was just a basic vague mm-hmm. like what nation area you were. Old going. man was fine. Well, I mean, I yeah, really, you, just, yeah. you didn't actually help by calling The old him. man is cooler, actually, as a nickname, yeah. if anything. <laughs> she goes, what do you think it means? <laughs> Maybe he's from Rome. I don't... Yeah, yeah, probably, I mean, yeah, that's what we got. He's elderly, I would Perhaps think. Perhaps yeah. an older gentleman. <laughs> so, okay, so she knows that. Now we have to check in on the brothers. Stooge cop number two is walking into the bar. Greenlee. Greenlee. He comes in Balls first, screaming sacomatic in case we forgot what his catchphrase was. <laughs> okay, but I wonder if he workshopped that one too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but we're about to find out that Ponza, the short guy killer, actually captured Greenlee and has this is a diversion. So that means is that pa- yeah, that means Ponza captured Greenlee and was like, "You need to do your sacomatic joke as a diversion at the beginning, and then I'm going to be able to attack him easier." And that's what happens. <laughs> yeah. I have so many questions about the moments before this scene, not this scene. Right? Because this scene right. is, he shoots a good, good guy cop number two, the only person I could possibly care about less than Rocco from the first <laughs> movie. Right? They might as well shoot the fucking pizza guy who delivers their food and expect right. us to have an emotional moment about it. They shoot them. Then they all get in a gunfight, which is unrelated to the misdirection. Right. I feel like I want to see the conversation that took place outside where he was like negotiating to have something better to say with the hitman. He was like, look, you're obviously going to shoot me as soon as I go in. Just don't make me say sacomatic. Let me say something like, I love my wife and kids. I mean, it doesn't matter. You're no, 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 no. Sac- sacomatic was from earlier. You said that. Uh, be fine, the I'll say sacomatic's my last word. But the other thing, too, is that this is the opposite of a distraction, right? Right. Like, they, like <laughs> right. The, the idea is if you wanted them distracted, you just walk into the bar and then shoot them. Or not use the same entrance that, yeah, okay, yeah. This yeah, is or great. have him go in the back and say sacomatic. Great fucking plan. <laughs> hey, maybe you want to tape me up and write like Aaron Gobra on my ass? Yeah, <laughs> this, yeah, exactly. Come on. I hear that works perfectly. Think this through. What about Italy forever, right? <laughs> but yeah, but so Ponza, that's the, um, the short priest killer guy. He comes in, they fire a few guns, but then Billy Connolly shows up to like shoot him even better. And they have the weirdest goddamn scene I think I've ever seen in my life. 
The, oh what the fuck is this Russian okay. roulette thing? What's supposed to be happening here? Okay. <laughs> Great question. The answer is cocaine Troy Duffy. But yep. yeah. what's, here's what we're watching. <laughs> Billy Connolly shows up. They have this gunfight, whatever. And then he's like, okay, time out. Time out, please. Thank you. I've brought a matching pair of specifically dedicated Russian roulette revolvers that I mm-hmm. have. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. And we're going to that game now we're gonna we're have gonna we're gonna have roulette. a russian roulette off yeah and yeah. even the characters in the movie like the two brothers are like dad are you you doing russian roulette for no reason again because i know like you have those revolvers but like each time you do this it never makes sense what are you doing <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but apparently pons is just in i'm like why wouldn't you just keep pulling the trigger you can probably pull the trigger six times quicker than he can yes <laughs> but no he is in on taking turns firing while they stare ominously at each other in between. Yeah. And that's all that happens. It's not like he asks him questions and he's like, uh, I'm going to turn the, I'm going to fire again if you don't answer. Like, nope. They just take turns and, and it turns out that Billy Connolly's bullet was sooner. By the internal logic of the movie, I'm wondering if he is like frozen by the fact that Billy Connolly is taller than he is. <laughs> 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 just, All right, take off your gloves, hand to hand, hand to hand. To, I want to yeah. see this. I have to time do out. what the tall guy says. But Damn. the whole time they're doing this, and Billy Connolly is asking for information, and guns keep clicking, and the brothers are like, "It just seems like the information is not going to come." And then you're going to, "Blam!" He kills him, and they're like, "Yep." So we got nothing, and he's Ooh. dead. Now he's dead. What do we do now? Now I should point out that right before they fire and kill him, the brothers get on their knees and start praying. So God did well, it. Yeah, counts. Yeah, of course, God, <laughs> God is one of God the killers is. in this movie, right? Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. So, a big fucking stupid Russian roulette aside, they didn't get any information. They just eventually shot this character in the face. We, sp- he's dead now. We've spent the whole goddamn movie setting this character up to do something. He's just shot in the fucking face. Now we're done with him. He's done. He's done. Remember when we had a mystery to find out who this character was? Yeah. And it never fucking mattered. Jesus, <laughs> stupid ass fucking Christ. So everything we've said so far, that was the cold open. The movie's starting now. Yeah, yeah here we go. <laughs> oh, geez. well, and then we got to watch Greenlee die. We have to have the emotional moment where he's like, I don't think I'm going to make it. I'm like, you were shot in the back with a shotgun. Of course you're not. Who the fuck thought you were going to make it? Yeah, I feel like we were supposed to be sad here. And <laughs> I... I don't know (laughs) what Troy Duffy thought an audience would experience while watching this movie is baffling to me. (laughs) Baffling. Like if you ever watched like a Kabuki performance where everyone speaks the language and everyone laughs at the same time, except for you. That's how I feel watching Troy (laughs) Duffy's writing. (laughs) Oh, y'all know that, that Italian Duke. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. So, okay, so now the brothers are sadly sitting in a bar wondering what the hell this movie's even about anymore. And then they have a spiritual flash sideways to the dead guy from the first movie. <laughs> Rocco. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and a cat walks across the, the bar. The cat. And that was Skippy. Skippy. Skippy's yeah. the cat yes. that Rocco shot by accident. That's actually pretty clever. One. The cat went to heaven, at least. That's, yeah, right. No, I yeah. like that part. But he's there to basically say, hey, man, don't let Greenlee die and bum you out. We are most of the way through Act 3. We do not have time for that shit. How about I give you some everyman wisdom about how the world's too woke these days and people need to get over it? <laughs> Heath, um, <laughs> buddy, yeah, did you, uh, did you base your life philosophy on this speech from Greenlee? <laughs> <laughs> um, we like... Buildings and hockey and yes, this uh, I think it got so specifically about Heath. I was like, oh man! You measure twice, you cut once, you play <laughs> hockey, <laughs> you drink and you smoke. That's men, and you men use racial do. slurs. We've Definitely lots of racial slurs. Great, and th- I feel like you've added one more element here that I didn't want to <laughs> associate. <laughs> well, I mean, but yes, that is what they say. <laughs> It's it's literally it's a toxic masculinity montage, right? As delivered by the least likable character who wasn't a space Nazi in the last 20 years. <laughs> I can't. This is like the waiter puts down your sizzling fajitas at Ruby Tuesdays. And he's like, let me tell you a little something about life. <laughs> 
So, and then Billy Connolly steps in. He's like, okay, you guys over that other character's death. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, okay, let me explain what the fucking plot even is now. You weren't here for my earlier flashback, but I'm going <laughs> to cut you in on it. Let me explain my tragic backstory, boys. My father was murdered in front of me. <laughs> and then I just kept killing people. <laughs> um, which now that I sort of say it out loud doesn't make me a sympathetic character at all. It just sort of makes me a overachieving murderer, I guess. <laughs> at some point, he's like, I feel like this is all my fault. I'm like, yeah, yeah, actually, 100%. Was your fault? Literally yeah, all of us. That Russian roulette thing was so stupid. We were telling yeah. you literally <laughs> at the time, you're like, this is dumb. You're not going to get any information. And then it's just one more person you killed. You yeah. get how that's dumb. And there's this amazing moment here, too, because especially for a person like me that just barely remembers the first movie, because this flashback is where we see him making his superhero multi gun <laughs> vest, <laughs> which I didn't remember from the first movie. I'm like, wow, they're really digging in on how he got into. Clothes making. Uh, yep. I don't. <laughs> is, this, is he going to have super clothes making abilities later? Is this a superhero? He's he's got an all. He's using an all <laughs> in his of, backstory. You don't you see that a lot. Of all of the superhero montages, we get one of the vest. Yeah, exactly. Under, under construction. Also, I I have what would be described by many as a dad bod, and that's why I don't write skin tight leather. On a regular basis, yep, because mm -hmm, yep. by the end of it, we see Billy Connolly in his weird sort of pseudo gimp suit full of guns. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a great look. <laughs> also, I just wanted a flash cut forward where they're like, do you know what extended magazines are? And he's just like weeping in the corner. I wore a vest for 40 years. <laughs> So, yeah, and we even get the flash of him, like, actually using the vest for the first time, and they cannot help but show you what a terrible fucking way it is. It's like, wow, yeah, you yeah. can't get at him if you, if you hit the trigger first. You're blowing your own fucking chin up with that one. This is <laughs> dumb. I also love that we get the origin story of Gun Guy here. That had to have been Gun Guy's dad with a paper bag full of guns, right? Yeah, yeah. that's oh, right. right. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> fucking American dream. You start in a paper bag and end up in a big concrete basement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it turned out that back then when he was murdering every gangster he could find, it turned out his partner in, in that was actually just trying to clear the streets of competition so he could become <gasps> the old man. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he's probably the <laughs> middle-aged middle middle man. Age yeah, right. Man. <laughs> <laughs> I've leveled up since then, so... <laughs> I love that there's a moment where he's like, I can't stop. And I'm like, no, you actually can. It's like super easy to not kill people. Yep. It turns <laughs> out pretty... you can just not do that. Yeah, yeah just exactly. So yeah, so then we cut to the modern day where it's like, and now all of this shall play out after all these years or whatever. Is this the tomatoes code moment? <laughs> yeah. The Rome, th this is when now we're in the modern day yeah. and mm -hmm. the Roman old man calls somebody and he asks for tomatoes, which, which means kill him Italianly. I, yeah, <laughs> I am out of tomatoes as the camera very conspicuously is focusing only on the tomatoes. Right. Well, yeah. as, if, as if to say, get it. <laughs> It's not right. he's not really yeah. talking about tomatoes. <laughs> That's what's so amazing is again, we're watching Troy Duffy write for Troy Duffy's audience. So Troy <laughs> right. Duffy's like, he might as well again be in the front, popped up like a Mortal Kombat extra, being like, Don't worry, guys, he's not actually out of tomatoes. It's code <laughs> for uh, the bad guys. Why is he lying to that fella? <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> let's get an eight ball. Me, you, me, and the person watching the movie. <laughs> So then we get uh, cops rushing in to tell Agent Cuntface or whatever that Eunice has gone rogue. She's going to solve that crime after all. And she's not supposed to do that because they're in league with the old man. Anyway, yeah. Again, I feel like this scene would have worked better before he came in and relieved her of duty and accused her of being <laughs> yeah. rogue and yeah. on the... Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, but all the, the good guys are all arming up. She's brought information with her. She's like, I'm going to I'm not actually in the action part because, you know, we're still a little behind the times in terms of that. But, you know, I did help. She has this insane moment before she leaves. She's like, do me a favor, boys. And I've never asked this before. 
kill the bad guy. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, that's our whole thing. That's yeah, our whole that's thing. What, what did you think we, we were doing here? We were going to... What did you think? That, oh, we yeah. were just going to go visit him and then come back. Which Why would we have all these guns and shit? Troy Duffy couldn't think of a good line for me to leave on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Right, exactly. <laughs> Y'all want some cocaine? Tostito scoops are delicious. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. But then everybody prays up, tops off their potions, and gets ready for the big showdown. Right. So they go to this creepy greenhouse that we flash to here and there when we're halfway, but not quite introducing the old man. Right. <laughs> and he's he's eating tomatoes, like a whole tomato, yeah. dipping it in salt like an apple and eating it like it was like a power move and like fucking Oh, kind of sexual. That it, looked, tasty, I mean, it looked really honestly. good. Tasty. Yeah. Wise. yeah. OK, um, so yeah. I have like a page and a half of notes about who is this for. But thank you, Heath. It's for Heath. Oh, <laughs> <for me. laughs> Okay, it wasn't. You didn't find that like beautifully sex. This, it was okay, for this Heath is Peter and Peter Fonda <laughs> eating an, a drippy tomato like an apple. That's not for you. Okay, I guess that's that's, the, for, that's for nobody but me right now. No, it's for you and Kelly. <laughs> that's the that's the fetish party I'm planning. <laughs> <laughs> and Peter Fonda is not easy to get a hold of. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> show I know, up. I know, I know a guy. He's, that's fine. <laughs> he's pretty easy. He's in this movie. Yeah, right, <laughs> right, fair. and he. Because bad accent work is as much a part of this series as guns, apparently. He's there to make the Southern accent seem okay and Billy Connolly's Irish accent to seem okay because he's going to go for Italian selectively. Okay, but here's the thing. <laughs> like, it would be hard to find an actor with a more distinctive and singular voice to try to ask to do a different voice than Peter F Al Pacino. They could have been like, Al Pacino, can you do a stereotypical Jewish voice? But other than that, <laughs> this is the weirdest choice that they could have asked Peter Fonda to do. At some point, we get a slow motion rosary drop again. Yeah. yeah. Now, I kind of want Marky Mark to be this guy doing the, the, the old. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which would have been every bit as good. So, yeah, so we have this long, loaded fucking moment while Billy Connolly sits next to Peter Fonda and they all and they're both going like, you know, the two of us, man, you could really do something with the two of us in a scene. You're not we're not we're not gonna. Though. It's so silly. He's covered in leather, so he's super squeaky. <laughs> and he keeps taking off his badass sunglasses and then putting them back on yes, again the yes. shots so that he can take them off literally every time he speaks. <laughs> Peter Fonda starts the frog and the scorpion story and then messes it up. He's like, you see, we are like the frog and the scorpion. We are opposites. <laughs> I feel like, sorry. I feel like so much of this movie was written with the idea in mind that you can say anything with an Irish or an Italian accent and it'll be fine. Yep. <laughs> and it was also written with the, uh, with the idea that they were going to find people who could do Italian and Irish accents. We can't always have what yeah. we're going <laughs> right, for, yeah. I guess. And look. At this point, the movie at least pretends it wants to be about why did he sell out his best friends and to the mob and, you know, put me away in jail and threaten my children's life. And he's like, you could never understand. Never mind. It was for mob power. I wanted to be a little bit more powerful in the mob. Yeah. You. That's why. I'm <laughs> oh, okay. Troy Duffy watched an M. Night Shyamalan movie and was like, yeah, I can totally do that. <laughs> <laughs> Can we just circle back? How is that like the frog and the scorpion? Do, we spend <laughs> yeah, time on that? Do you know what that story is? They're, they're saying it in accents, Heath. It's fine. Mm. Yeah. They don't, the frog, yeah. he gets his peanut butter in the scorpion. <laughs> I, don't think there's, I don't think there was peanut butter in that you story. You have to bring the scorpion back over on the, on the Sorry, boat. Am I the peanut the butter? With the Bag of rice. Uh, I'm the bag? Who's the peanut butter? And so finally we get to a point where basically like both of the actors are like, I'm just out of shit. You want to do the shooty, shooty, bang, bang part? No. Like, yeah. Shooty, shooty, bang, bang. <laughs> and, yep. and that, and that's what we do. Just people standing still and firing guns at other people. Cause that's all they've got. There was a conflict of bullet shooting. <laughs> <laughs> the vest has six guns now, which is, yep. I feel like even more impractical. Yep. <laughs> And I like that Peter Fonda is just sitting there viscerally reacting to how dumb this movie yes! is. Yes! Yes! <laughs> just like, well, this doesn't make any fucking... They just jumped all the way through the roof and they're fine because they landed in a fountain? 
<laughs> what the fuck is even going on here? At some point, a fan randomly falls to the ground. <laughs> I want this book, this gun vest to evolve in like part three. And I'm really rooting for a part three. I know it's <laughs> it's been written and rejected like a hundred times in part three. I want the, the, the vest to become just like giant leather gimp suit that holds so many different things all at once. I feel like, like that. Yeah. they should give it a person like it should be like Dr. Strange's cape or something. You know, it should have its own personality at a certain point. That'd be pretty <laughs> cool. <laughs> Can we set up a party based on this? So, yeah, so everybody just shoots at everybody. Fucking Romeo comes in and I'm like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that character. Yeah, he should be here, too, I guess. <laughs> He's there. He exists. Right. Peter Fonda looks around like this is not really all that impressive for this to be the end of the. Sometime before they said action, Peter Fonda was like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life. And he was like, cool, hold that energy. <laughs> <laughs> and we're rolling. <laughs> So Billy Connolly gets shot because he's damned if he's coming back for a third one. And he's like, hey, hey, quick, before I die, drag me back in there to Peter Fonda. I thought of something clever to say uh, before I die. Quick, quick, quick. So they do. And he's like, I'll see you in a minute. And then he shoots him dead. Get it? Because they're both. And if, we, and if we thought it was bad that Troy Duffy took 10 years to make this movie, uh, he had 25 years to think up that speech. <laughs> <laughs> see you in a minute. I thought about it some more and the scorpion thing doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah, so he dies. We see that he was carrying he was carrying a baby picture of them in his hat like you do. Oh, very sad. We didn't have any doubts that he cared about his sons. No. Nope. Like that reveal is meant for like, oh, he cared all along. <laughs> Just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that was established in the first movie though. Yeah. <laughs> And then, okay, and so now, by now, all the FBI agents have shown up at this house for reasons that are never sufficiently explained, but they're, they're there to kill the brothers. So the brothers come out with their guns and, and set, and set them down and, and su surrender. Kind of a weird way to end your action movie, right? Like they set yeah. up this big uh, shootout and then they're just like, nah, just, we're not, we're not gonna. Wait, there wait. was a peaceful surrender! <laughs> <laughs> So, okay. So they're done, apparently. Meanwhile, Eunice is escaping to a non-extradition country. You're thinking to yourself, this is over. Well, no, sir. There is a part three to set up as well. Sure is. And the priest, can I just say, way, way too accomplished at hiding people in non-extradition countries. <laughs> <laughs> she even turns to him at one point and she's like, how do you have all this in place, father? And he's like, I mean... Come on, it's kid fucking. You know it's kid yeah, we, have, we have 100% done this before, trust me. <laughs> we don't have laws. Do you guys have laws? That well, sucks. He even says that it's it's so scary and sad if you, you know, don't assume that they only ever do good with this power. He's like, oh, yeah, in a lot of countries, they don't even make us follow the law. And then some countries don't really even have laws. Yeah, no, we got this. We got this. We got Seriously, this like vigilante murder is nothing. You could fuck a kid right now and yeah. you're with us. You're still fine. So, like, yeah. did you want to... Uh, no, we're going to Costa Rica. You paused? You paused? Oh, oh cuz you were scared yeah. of me. Okay, I get it. I get it. And so she's like she's like, "I don't know. I don't understand this whole helpful priest bullshit. Don't you guys rape kids?" And he's like, "Yeah, you you need some convincing. It's okay. Willem Dafoe agreed to be in this scene if he was allowed to keep fishing the whole time. <laughs> Willem Dafoe was on vacation down here anyways, and we followed him with a camera crew and the cops didn't come on time. <laughs> He's wearing his outfit from Aquaman. Yeah. <laughs> so Can I just give credit where credit is due? Willem Dafoe has four lines in this scene and he attempts to actively walk back the weird, harmful, gay stereotype performance he did in the first movie, <laughs> line to line. Right? He starts out, he's like, hello, honey. Good to finally see you. I'm glad that we know each other. I always played this character this way. <laughs> I have a really good slap shot. Wow, you went, you did a whole, whole arc. Yeah, and so we learned that he faked his death and I'm like, he didn't even die in the first fucking movie. You just did that to explain why he wasn't. There was not. There was no need for this. I only pretended to kick Troy Duffy in the balls when he came to see me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And just as I'm writing, Jesus fucking Christ, isn't it a little too late to add extra plot bullshit? 
they reveal that they were absolutely certain there was going to be a third one when this mm-hmm. came out. So. Oh, there will be. I don't think there will be, right. man. I'm, I'm saying 2029. Get it ready, out. everyone. Yep. <laughs> 2029. Fuck. <laughs> they're on. They're still on good pace. He's, he's he's writing his metaphors, man. Yep. He's yeah. Exactly. There's only so many slurs. He had to come up with some new material. Yeah. But at any rate, that Eunice and Willem Dafoe start plotting how they're going to break the boys out of prison. But that is another sequel. Yeah. To be clear, the moral of the story is that the Vatican is the biggest corporation in the world, and they're backing a vigilante murder gang as the good guys. That's, yep. that's the end of the movie. Yeah, that's the fantasy this movie puts yes. for them. <laughs> right, and they're overstating how good the Catholic Church is. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty fucked up. Yeah, so before we close out, anything that any of you would like to apologize to the universe for? Anybody? Nothing? Fans of the original. I'm okay. sorry for Callie's tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There you go. All right. Well, Callie, thank you so much for joining us today. It was really fun to have you on. I want to point out that it was mostly really Eli and Heath that made fun of you and not me. And yeah, I, I appreciate that. Also, so if you don't mind, can you remind our listeners uh, where they can go to hear more from you? Yes, in the time that we were recording, I have registered poopsplaining.com. Okay, good. good. <laughs> so. <laughs> Don't uh, no, go to poopsplaining.com. Yeah. I'm 100% not going to do that. Uh, <laughs> I make a podcast called Queer Splaining, and you can find it wherever you listen to podcasts. Or just check the show notes. We're going to have it linked there as well. Callie, thank you so much. My pleasure. And well, that does it for our review of Boondock Saints to All Saints Day. That's not going to do it for the episode just yet because we still need to ensure the audience that we haven't come to our senses. So, Eli, tell us what's on deck. We'll be watching the Christian documentary about aliens, Unidentified. Oh, amazing. Honestly, Eli had written Unidentified in the notes, and I thought maybe he just wasn't sure what the fuck this movie was yet. So, <laughs> but no, it's called Unidentified. Gotcha. Cristiano Brothers, yes. I believe. Ooh. Oh, really? One of them, maybe one of them. Top, one, oh. At least a Cristiano involved Okay, well, in now I'm genuinely looking forward to it. So with that, we're going to bring episode 309 to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to Callie Wright for hanging out with us today, and perhaps even huge thanks to all the Patreon donors to help make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful, and thereby earn early access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review and sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing the Citation, and D&D Minus, and The Skeptic Credit, available wherever podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com. Legal services for this podcast are brought up by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robinson takes care of our social media. Our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slott. Maybe we'll drive on Mars. All other music was written and performed by our audio engineer, Morgan Clark, and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick, I'm no illusions. Promise to work hard to earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Breakfast Club clothes. Troy Duffy went on to write the movie Guest House starring Pauly Shore and Steve-O and nothing else ever nothing, he ever wrote. Nothing. The script for Boondock Saints 3 was so bad that even people who agreed to be in this movie balked. Norman Reedus desperately wants us all to forget about these two movies. And Callie Wright made an appointment to get a Romeo tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2021. All rights reserved.